Yes, 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 yes. So it is. So it is. And so it is. Well, good morning again, everyone. Welcome to all of our first time guests. Happy holidays. It's so good to see you all in the place today. I have a number of things to talk about, and I'm, I'm, I'm letting Spirit guide me because there, there, there's so much, and we'll, we'll see what, what comes, comes through. We have been in a, a really powerful series, and I, and I pray that it has, has been profound for you and really supportive for you as we're talking from this place that your prayers have already been answered. But the reason we don't necessarily know that our prayers have been answered is because we don't know the secrets to answered prayer. And so that's what we've been talking about. In week one, we started with, but I don't want to change. And we talked about the first secret of, of answered prayer is that prayer is answered through you. And what I shared with everyone on that Sunday was that when we pray a prayer, whatever it is, what we're really saying to life, to God, to the universe, to source, whatever name feels good for you, what we're saying is, I want to change, I'm ready to change, and I'm willing to change. Because prayer is answered through you. And I used the story about the man that wanted to be saved from drowning, and, and God sent a helicopter, a canoe, and a boat, and he kept saying, no, I'm waiting for God to save me. <laughs> Realized, but actually it was always, uh, it was happening through him. It was right there all the time. Last week, great ideas, great contrast. When we look at the second secret of answered prayer, prayer is answered when you listen. We looked at, at Joseph and Mary, realizing that they had been told something very profound as they began to listen, something that, that, that was problematic for each of them in different ways. But what I talked about is that if prayer is answered when you listen, there's something that's very important, the very first thing that was said to them by the angels. The angel that came to them separately said, fear not, do not be afraid. And so the first important thing that you must know is that as you are praying, whatever it is that you're seeking, the first thing to hear and listen for is the fear not, the do not be afraid. So you recognize that you can move through this transformation that's taking place as prayer is answered through you. You have to move from a place of recognizing that God has your back and is supporting you and sees the whole picture, even though you don't. You may be given something and, and have an idea, an inkling of something that is bigger than your current situation or circumstances which can move you into fear, doubt, and worry. But when you hear fear not, it's saying there's a big picture and you will be carried and supported throughout the entire process. So then we have today the third secret of answered prayer. Prayer is answered when you welcome everything in. And as I've shared, this series is inspired by a, a wonderful novel, The Prayer Chest, by our dear friends, Reverend August Gold and Reverend Joel Fatino. So I invite you to grab the, the, the book and read it over the holidays because it's perfect for this time of year. It just, I always say it reminds me of a Hallmark Channel movie. Um, uh, it just has that feeling. And so in the, in, in the novel, when we get to the third secret, here's what we hear. Do not make the mistake that mankind makes when it throws open its arms to growth or good fortune alone and rejects all else. Doing so leaves one lopsided, like a cart with wheels on one side only. Look how effortlessly nature shifts from day to night, season to season, releasing each in its turn. But mankind is not like this. We choose gain over loss and light over dark. By refusing half, we are no longer able to receive the whole of our answered prayer. Make yourself ready for loss and letting go as perhaps part of the answer to your prayer. Mm, take a breath, y'all, take a breath. Make yourself ready for loss and letting go as perhaps part of an answer to your prayer. It may not immediately be apparent how failure leads to flourishing or loss fertilizes the ground for gain, but trust that it shall. The third secret can be a great test of our faith, and it is precisely at this point where most men fail. Take a breath, y'all, take a breath. Prayer is answered when you welcome everything in. And at the heart, what it's really saying here is that at the second that you pray your prayer, speak your prayer, put your prayer in, in, a, in, the, in a prayer chest, or leave your worries at the door, you, you must begin to listen. But now everything that occurs in your life from that moment forward is your prayer being answered. But we don't think about that, because sometimes what happens is like, well, I asked for more money, and, and three new bills showed up. 
And so we, if we understand this, this is, this is what's powerful. We begin to understand this. And so I'm going to talk from the topic of every birth is holy. And, and, and the reason why I'm talking about this topic is we talked about Joseph and Mary last week. And so I want to talk about the shepherds and the magi this week. Um, and and I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to go a bunch of places today um, because it's, it's, it's important. I want to give you um, a lot to think about with this season. And I also want to give you something to prepare you uh, as we move into the new year. Because what we're doing on New Year's Eve, as we understand the secrets now to answer prayer, we are going to set our prayers. We're going to have a, a prayer basket that everyone will bring up on New Year's Eve from this intention, recognizing that when you drop this prayer on New Year's Eve, it's time to listen, and it's time to welcome everything in, okay? So the shepherds and the magi, and you notice I didn't say wise men, and there's a reason why. So as I shared last week, um, we get Joseph's story uh, in one gospel, and we get Mary's story in another gospel, Matthew and Luke. Similarly, the shepherds and the magi, we don't read about them in both texts. The shepherds are written about in the Gospel of Luke. And as I said, if you watch the uh, Charlie Brown Christmas, that's the, that's the part that Linus always recites, right? About the shepherds watching their flock by night and the angel of the Lord comes and the heavenly host and all of that, right? And then in the Gospel of Matthew, we have the magi. Now, we generally hear them called the wise men, right? If you read most English translations of the scripture, you will see wise men, but the proper word is magi. And even magi is still, still myster mysterious because what's a magi, <laughs> right? What is that? The proper translation of that word magi is astrologers. So we're gonna be using, I'm gonna be putting on my lens I'm gonna put on my lens of astrotheology. We're gonna be looking at a hermeneutic of astrotheology because I think it's important that we understand how much this Christmas story has everything to do with what's happening in our seasons and what's happening in the heavens. And so what's interesting is that in the Gospel of Matthew, when you have the secret decoder ring that I like to, like, like to talk about, when you under, look for the clues, they're right there. So in the text, it talks about the wise men that they are from the East, and it says that they saw a star in the east. And because they saw a star in the east, they knew that something significant had happened. And they actually knew that this, the star in the east um, uh, was in Bethlehem. And so they were looking to find um, this child that had been born. Now, one of the things that's very interesting, when we see east or when I see east, because of my secret decoder ring, and I recognize that we're talking, this is a Jewish story, right? We're talking about Jewish people, right? Christianity didn't exist. We're not talking about any Christians, right? It takes me back to the First Testament or the Old Testament um, because it's something very interesting as Jesus is born in Bethlehem of Judea or Judah. What's also interesting is that when you look at the text of Matthew specifically, we know that we're talking to a very Jewish community because the writer took the time to, to break out the lineage at the beginning of Matthew um, to, for us to understand the lineage that, that Jesus was coming from. And he, he talks about starting from Abraham or uh, Abram, well, he became Abraham and, and it's also known as Israel. We, we have this idea of the progeny of the descendants coming from this consciousness of Abraham down now to be um, through Joseph. Through Joseph and Mary and we have the birth of the Christ and so when we look at that and we understand that Jesus is born in Bethlehem of Judea or Judah and he was born in, and the star was in the east we have some powerful clues now one of the clues that we have is that because he was born in Judah or Judea I got to go back to the Old Testament and I got to look at the tribe of Judah now, Judah is one of the sons of Abraham or Israel. And, 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 and what's interesting about this tribe, if you go to the book uh, of Numbers in, in the second chapter, you find something interesting about this tribe. It says here that the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, the Israelites shall camp each in their respective regiments under ensigns by their ancestral houses. There's a clue, clue word there. Anytime you see houses, we're talking about astrological houses, not physical houses. And they shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. Those to camp on the east side toward the sunrise shall be of the regimental encampment of Judah. Now, what it says in the Gospel of Matthew, we see um, it says that he was born um, uh, in the, the rising star um, in the east. A sun, the sun is a star, right? We know that. And so when we have this idea of a star rising in the east, it's giving us the same 
it's pointing us back to this piece where we see that Judah is the camp on the east side toward the sunrise. Now, where it gets even more interesting is that Judah is the tribe astrologically that represents Leo. For my astrology folks in the house, what, what's, uh, what's, what planetary body rules Leo? The sun. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> So we're talking about the birth of the sun because we recognize that what happens on the 25th, after we come out of the darkness of the solstice in the three days, the sun is reborn on the 25th. All of a sudden, we begin the process of more light. That's the astrological significance of this, this thing that we experience every year and we celebrate as the birth of the Christ or the birth of Jesus or the birth of the sun, the, the, the morning star. Okay. So what's also interesting then when we understand why is the East also significant, we got to go to, to Genesis and the end of the Adam and Eve story. Very significant. I love this. Because at the end of the second creation story, the second creation story is the one about the apple and the serpent. The first one, we have none of that. The second one, we get the story about the apple and the serpent. And at the very end of that, after Jesus says, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? Well, and because, you, because you've eaten of the tree, you're cursed, and they're kicked out of Eden. And what we read in, in, in the end of chapter 3 is it says, He, or God, drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming, turning to guard the way to the tree of life. This is another clue. Because we recognize then that the way to get back to the garden is the east side. And so we recognize what happened in the East on the so-called 25th day of December was the Son, the Christ, this consciousness, knowing the soul felt its worth is born. Therefore, we get back into the East. We get back into the garden. This is the idea, the symbolism that, that, that we're being given when we understand um, um, what, what's, what's happening here. And so this is why the Magi were so interested, according to the story, to meet this being. And of course, this is also why the shepherds were, were so interested. But there's one other piece we got to talk about. Bethlehem, which means house of bread. When you eat bread, where does it go? Where does it go? It goes, to your, it goes to your stomach, right? OK. And I know we're familiar with the chakra system, right? What chakra is represented in that area? Solar, solar, sun, solar plexus, house of bread. You see it? Okay. Jesus was born in Judea, the tribe of light at the east, in the house of bread, the solar plexus. Okay? Now, why is this interesting? And, and this, this question came up in 90 Days to Greatness earlier. Um, we've been studying the master key system. And Charles Hanel talks about the solar plexus a lot in, in the text, in the beginning of the text. And, and I want to read something that he shares here because it's, it's important as we understand why the birth of the Christ in the solar plexus is so important. This is where the consciousness is born. He writes, we are related to the world within by the subconscious mind. The solar plexus is the organ of this mind. The, the, our conscious mind, our brain, is, is the organ of our conscious thoughts. Once we receive an idea in our brain, then it actually is then rooted in our subconscious mind through our solar plexus. The symp sympathetic system of nerves presides over all subjective sensations, such as joy, fear, love, emotion, respiration, imagination, and all subconscious phenomena. It is through the subconscious that we are connected with the universal mind and brought into relation with the infinite constructive forces of the universe. So if we understand this, then if it is through the subconscious and that is ruled by the solar plexus, it is in this house of bread, the Bethlehem, where the Christ is born, that's where we are connected to the universal mind. He goes on and he says, the solar plexus has been likened to the sum of the body because it is the central port point of distribution for the energy which the body is constantly generating. This energy is very real energy and this sun is a very real sun. Now, why is this also important? We have a, a, a beautiful principle that, that we must understand, a hermetic principle, the principle of correspondence, which simply says, as above, so below, as below, so above. 
And so we can take astrology and we can look at the fact that we can watch the path of the sun from our perspective in the northern hemisphere. It goes down into the southern hemisphere and it comes back up again and is reborn. And then, of course, the, the, the resurrection is, is, is reflected in the time of spring. We can look at that and we can see that and we can marvel at that truth. But we must also know as above, so below. That same reality is happening within each and every one of us. Because any time you get an idea, when you pray a prayer and you are seeking an answer, what begins to happen is in your conscious mind as you begin to listen and become receptive to that truth and become receptive to the reality of that thing becoming a reality it now is is it goes into the house of bread it now is in the, your solar plexus in the bethlehem and that consciousness that christ within you is is being reborn and so this is one of the reasons why we celebrate this time because it's reminding us of this cycle and here's the thing you don't have to go through the whole year to experience this cycle it's literally happening every second every moment you get to tap into this consciousness and bring life to anything that exists so the third secret to answer prayer is that prayer is answered when you welcome everything in interesting and so what I love to think about is how the Magi and the shepherds chose after hearing in different ways about the birth of this child, this Christ, this consciousness, this knowingness, that um, they had to go and see him. They had to go bring gifts. They had to go worship him, right? And so as we understand, if we think about the birth of an idea and as we have taken this journey, conception is holy. The idea when you get an idea and it feels good and you get excited about it and you tell your mom and them about it or you tell your best friend or you write it down in your journal, that's holy because it's exciting. And then we recognize that the incubation and the nurturing part of, of, of bringing that idea forward is also holy because that can be nice. And I know many times as I'm thinking about um, the, the physical birth of humans, there's, there's a time for, for many um, women when they're having a child where there's that sweet moment where you just feel good and you look good and then your skin looks different and, 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 and it's a beautiful time. It's holy. But then also birth is holy. Actually, every birth is holy. And so what I invite you to consider and think about in this moment is that if prayer is well answered when you welcome everything in, and many times that means a letting go of, many times that means a, a surrender, many times that means things will show up that do not look like the thing you are asking for, what you must say to yourself is every birth is holy. Because I recognize something when I look at the, how humans are born. One of the things that's interesting, I've heard my mother say it many times, and I've heard my grandmother say it as well, that Given how excruciating childbirth is, it doesn't make sense that anybody would continue to do it over and over again. But what they have said to me is, oh, you forget about it. You forget about it, right? And that's powerful because if we think about our own lives, let's think about the correspondence. Each of us have, have experienced something in our lives that we had to move through changes. We had to move through a transformation process. There was a loss. There were things that everything didn't look right in the beginning and you didn't know how and things might have looked crazy and you might have thought you were crazy, but you're on the other end of it and everything is good and everything is perfect. But now you want to create something new and you forgot about the process that you went through before. But if you understand that every birth is holy, it's important that you go back to that process process and remember oh wait that was a holy process because I recognize that letting go that I had to let go of then helped to shape me helped to make me helped me to bring me to where I am now those lessons that I experienced those so-called failures they were failures you're not a failure but those so-called failures were the things that I needed to to experience so that I could grow in the way that I needed to grow so that I could show up in the way that I needed to show up and so when we understand that every birth is holy, you're birthing something right now, I know you are. We're at the end of the year, I know you're thinking about the new year. I know for many of you, you're thinking about things that you still want to show up before the 31st or by the 31st. And it's important that you begin to speak to this thing and say every birth is holy because how we name our experiences matter. You gotta say, I am having a God experience. I am having a holy experience because my prayer is being answered right now. I know it doesn't look like it. I know it doesn't even feel like it. I know it looks crazy estranged and deranged but it's holy now what my dear brother Napoleon Hill says and I quote him all the time I love it he says every failure brings with it the seed of its equivalent success and think and grow rich I love that but there's something else he says in in, in the book 
for those of you who haven't, haven't read it or, or it's been a while, he tells the story of how his son um, was born and, and could not hear. And Napoleon Hill refused to accept, the idea, accept that idea. And so what he began to do was he began to speak because he realized before, this was because this was written so long ago, this was before we really understood bone induction, um, that actually the sound vibrates right, right here on our bones and so you can actually hear. And so what he began to do was speak and, and let the sound of his voice vibrate. And he began to speak affirmations into the mind and into the consciousness of his son. Not knowing how, there was, there was no reason to believe that anything was gonna change for his son. And at that time, the technology did not exist um, to be able to support him in hearing. We're so grateful and thankful that the technology exists now, but it did not exist then. But he began to just continue to affirm and speak into the consciousness of his son that he would hear that somehow, some way, again, not knowing how, not trying to figure it all out, just knowing that it would happen. And so what he says as he was telling that story, he says, every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. Hear this, hear this, hear this. Every adversity brings with it the seed of its equivalent advantage. That very thing that somebody told you was your weakness will become your strength at the right time. That very thing that you perceive as it's the worst part about you will be the thing that you need at the moment that you need it and it will become your advantage. Because he goes on and he says that desire backed by faith pushed reason aside and inspired him to carry on. So you match your desire, whatever that is, with faith and then you know that every adversity brings with it the seed of its equivalent advantage. And this, of course, is principle uh, out pictured again. In the Kabbalion, we have the principle of rhythm. It's the fifth principle. And it says, everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. And this is another way of talking about this principle, that when we welcome everything in, just as the earth welcomes light on one side and dark on the other side and then welcomes light on that side and welcomes dark on that side, knowing that it's spinning and it's going to keep getting light and keep getting light and keep getting light and sometimes we see the moon and sometimes we don't and then the moon is there again and then we don't. And at certain parts of the year we have more sunlight in one hemisphere versus another. This is what nature is teaching us because it's a, it's a powerful spiritual principle that outpictures in everything that we see. So what's interesting is that if you feel right now, if you're in a place or experiencing what feels like loss or what feels like not enough, if you recognize this pr principle of rhythm that all things rise and fall, the pendulum swing manifests in everything, the measure of the right is the measure to the left. What does that mean? You could be experiencing your poorest moment right now, but if the rhythm is always happening, that means that swing has to swing to the other side and you must experience your most abundant moment by law, by principle, but that's only if you welcome everything in. See, what we do so many times, we get to that point and we throw our hands up. We get to that point and we think we're being judged. We get to that point and we think that there's something wrong with us and we never go through the process of allowing to then allow that, that shift to happen. One of the things that we um, talked about in the um, Truth, Truth Sunday class, um, um, Money is God in Action, um, we, we read there, Barker talks about the fact that to understand, when you understand that money is God in action and to, to hold a prosperity consciousness around money, you actually get okay with the ebbs and flows. I've been watching people freak out about the stock market right now, right, because it's been dropping. That's the nature, the, but the pendulum swings to the left and the right, and so as, as much as it drops, there will be a rally that, 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 that not only covers that so-called loss, but then exceeds it. That's the nature of life, and so you understand that. When you understand your finances, just because you don't have money in the bank doesn't mean that you're poor. But you gotta get used to this thing, just like nature is used to this thing. And I'll, I'll close with these last two things. In the prayer chest, we read this, be like an ocean that refuses no river. Through an open vessel, prayer flows unobstructed, and heaven finds an inlet and outlet through which to reveal itself on earth. Now, I love that because for those of you, if you study science of mind, if you study um, um, uh, just 
New Thought 101. This idea of inlet and outlet is so important because we recognize as prayer is answered through us, we have to be, we make ourselves available for the expression of God to flow through us. And so we must be like an ocean that refuses no river. Last week I shared a Hafiz poem, and so I want to close with something from Rumi, which really just brings us all the way back to everything we've been saying, and I just first want to review. What's the first secret to answer prayer? Prayer is answered through you. What's the second secret to answer prayer? Prayer is answered when you listen. And finally, the third secret to answer prayer is that prayer is answered when you welcome everything in. So we're going to take the time on New Year's Eve to write down whatever that prayer is for 2019. But no, as you write down that last word and you put it in the envelope and you seal it, it's time to listen and it's time to welcome everything in. There's nothing random because life is happening through you. So life is responding to the very intention that you set. And so we have these words from Rumi. He says, if God said, Rumi, pay homage to everything that has helped you enter my arms, there would not be one experience of my life, not one thought, not one feeling, nor any act I would not bow to. Every birth is holy. Just as the wise men and the shepherds bowed before the birth of the Christ child, we recognize what that birth represents. It represents the birth of an idea, consciousness. We love our elder brother Jesus. We love the master teacher Jesus because we recognize he exemplifies what it looks like to fully embody that consciousness. But we do not worship him in the sense of putting him up above us because we recognize that each and every one of us have the capacity and capability to operate from this consciousness at any moment of our lives. Make that time today. Make that moment now. Look back upon your life, remembering that every birth is holy. Think about your previous birth experiences. Look to the holiness of the conception and the holiness of the incubation and the holiness of the birth that you, didn't, you couldn't see it. You wouldn't have called it holy in the moment. But you look back now and you realize it was holy. And that holy experience, that holy birth, is exactly what you needed and need now to give birth to this new Christ child. The body is like Mary. And each of us, each of us has a Christ within. With that, I invite you all to stand. Ooh, we take a deep breath in and we release. We take a deep breath in and we exhale. We breathe in love and we breathe out love. Mother, Father, God, source of all life, source of all strength, the ground in which we plant our roots, the mind that created all things and conceived of all things, the mind that creates to the tune of trillions, the mind that creates infinite numbers of planets and galaxies, the mind that creates the sun and the stars, the suns and the stars and the moons, the mind that created every being on this planet, unique and individual, the mind that created every plant and every animal, the mind that is love itself, that is a divine mind, intelligent mind, you, Mother, Father, God, that are absolute power, all power. You, Mother, Father, God, that are absolute wisdom and knowledge, all wisdom and all knowledge. And you, Mother, Father, God, that are omnipresence, constantly encountered. We turn our attention and our focus on you right now. For we recognize that as we put our focus and our attention on you, we are putting our focus and attention on that which enlivens and empowers us. We are putting our focus and attention on that universal substance which becomes all things. We are putting our focus and attention on our unity. 
For indeed, we are one with you as we are your expressions on this planet. You are the ocean and we are the wave. And what you are in the large, we are in the small. For we recognize as you say, let there be light and there is light. So we have the same power and capacity within our own life and within the worlds that we create to say, let there be light and there shall be light. We recognize what you are in the large, we are in the small. As you say, let me make man in my likeness and image. And you make us and you make humankind, man and woman, in your likeness and image. And it is. So we have the power and possibility and say, let me make this business in my likeness and image. And it is. We say, let me take this idea that is birthed in through and as me. And it is. So as we recognize our union, as we recognize our correspondence, as we recognize that there is no separation between you and us, we now speak this word in faith, we speak this word in confidence, and we speak this word affirmatively. Right here and now, I know that each and every person within this room has an intention. Each and every person in this room has a desire. Each and every person in this room is seeking transformation in some way. For as we pray our prayers, we are saying, I am ready for transformation. I am willing to become what I am not right now to experience what I will be, what I can be, what I shall be. And I see it in my mind's eye. It is so clear. And I now choose to focus on that reality. I now choose to focus on the significance of this thing, knowing that I am supported by all of life to bring it forward. So right here and right now, I speak this word in faith on behalf of my brothers and sisters, knowing that we are supported, knowing that every need is met, knowing that the people, places, and resources are rushing to us right now, knowing that we are magnetic and we are attracting the things to us that we desire, that we need, knowing that the way is being swept clear, knowing that through our allowing, we will let go of the things that do not serve us, that we will let go of the patterns, we will let go of the expectations, we will let go of the false beliefs that we need to release so that we can become the thing that we are praying about so that we can transform into the thing that we've been praying for mother father god i stand in agreement right here and now with my sisters and brothers my sister my brother i agree with you yes you can be that my sister my brother i agree with you yes you can have that my sister my brother i agree with you yes you can do that my sister my brother i agree with you yes the resources will be there my sister my brother i agree with you yes the way will be made clear my sister my brother i agree with you yes it will show up in time and on time my sister my brother i agree with you that thing it is it is it is it is it is i see it in consciousness with you i hold it in consciousness with you i live and relish in in the doneness of it and so right here and now I release this prayer I release this prayer back into the law because I recognize there is a law that is always in operation operating for our good and operating with and for our good so in complete surrender I let it go in complete confidence I let it go in complete expectation I let it go and just as a child has trouble sleeping on Christmas Eve because they can't wait to get to presents on Christmas morning, that is the posture we all stand in now. In absolute giddy expectation. And so with joy and thanksgiving, I release this prayer and together we say amen, ashe, and so it is. And so it is. Thank you, God.